Hello, and I'm, uh, this video is about uh, how to include inclusive design into your project for the Beer Craig's Offside Ready Online Challenge. Firstly, what is inclusive design? If you are unaware of it, there are major demographic changes taking place in the world today. And uh, the main uh, issue of concern for inclusion is that the population around the world is aging. If you look at this graph showing the uh, proportion of people of different ages in percentages, um, you'll see that in 1950, the bias was towards the younger and the middle age groups. And in 2050, the prediction is that the middle and the younger age groups will be the lesser proportion of the population and the older age groups, not 59 and 60 plus, indeed will be the larger age groups. And in some countries that indeed has happened already, such as Japan. If you think about uh, aging uh, populations and uh, you think about the situations that they are likely to be in within your project, um, there are a wide range of ways in which they will interact with your designs. The important thing about inclusive design is to make sure that they interact successfully and without frustration, despite the limitations or capability that they may have as a result of aging or indeed as a result of disability. And this is extremely important when you consider every aspect of design of a public use facility. Um, so, for example, who will be looking at the website about the facility before they arrive? Once they do arrive, how will they interact with information that you provide them with? Will they interact by pointing and visually absorbing the information? Uh, will they stand around looking at display screens, uh, puzzling over the situation and trying to control their children and their luggage? Uh, or even worse, will you provide a very poor quality um, facility which hasn't been thought through and doesn't allow them to interact with it uh, effectively at all. If you design computer screens for information such as information screens in a, uh, in a building or an open space, um, the interactions modes are very important and the sort of things you're going to have to consider is the use of hands for touch screens or the use of arms and fingers for pointing, whether the dialogue is a possibility, whether people can hear it, and the sizes of fonts and the use of colour in your screens. For that reason, inclusive design breaks down uh, capabilities into a range of different capabilities, each of which it, we found it's convenient for you to consider separately. So you consider people's visual capability separately, that is visual displays, but it also includes things like the visual uh, sight lines in your buildings or your signage, for example. It's about hearing. It's about whether people have a visual capability or whether they rely on hearing or whether they have poor or in inadequate hearing and they can't hear any information that you're giving them or understand dialogue if it's being uh, given by another source. How much uh, uh, can they reach and stretch to use uh, the facilities, open doors, um, use screens or touch screens, or indeed um, use things such as card swipes and lifts? Do they have restricted dexterity? Can they use their fingers uh, to pick up small objects or do they rely on, the, uh, on large and easily manipulated objects? Um, or do they have a, a, a very poor uh, a, a pain relationship with this? So dexterity is for them a painful operation, which you you don't want to um, uh, basically subject your your your, your uh, um, customers to pain in order to do some simple uh, information operation, or indeed to do any operation in your in your building. Can they move around? If they can move around, is it unassisted? If it is unassisted, then that's, do they have caretakers or do they have dependents to think about? What sort of intellectual function are you expecting from them? What sort of capability to reason about the building and about the wayfaring? Uh, how, how will they understand any information that's given to them? 
Uh, and of course, some may be uh, of different levels of intellectual function in terms of memory and in terms of comprehension. And also, it's very important to consider overarching medical conditions that have an effect on all those other things, including heart disease, uh, diabetes, um, epilepsy, and so forth, and uh, psychological conditions specifically um, regarding things like dementia and so forth, which may have an overall effect on people's ability to, to use uh, a, a, a space or a building. There are a lot of ways in which these things can be mitigated, and there are a lot of problems that are, are still without solution. If you're looking at the outdoor uh, structure of, a, of an area, perhaps at the area in front of an entrance way, consider how it might be uh, needed to be used in bad weather conditions. Consider the journey that a person with a impairment or a disability will have to take. Will they, for example, have to travel from a car parking area to an entrance way uh, with or without their wheelchair? If they have got wheelchairs, uh, uh, fantastic solutions to these problems include designing combined wheelchair step areas, such as the one illustrated here. Uh, and indeed, you can see how that has uh, considerable advantages over uh, trying to uh, uh, lower a wheelchair down a, uh, a step area with, uh, e you know, even with an assistant. Um, it is important to also consider staff who are going to use your facility as well as the uh, visitors uh, and customers. Some useful methods that you might want to consider that come from inclusive design are based around the idea of iterative design. This is to say, you go around a loop of design, examining the possibilities for inclusion and improving inclusion as you do so. So roughly speaking, you look at the context of use of some, of some part of the system, you break it down into a sequence of tasks, you look at how those tasks relate to the capability ranges of uh, such as hearing, vision, and uh, reach and stretch and locomotion. You, assess the amount of demand made by your design and you decide how many people might be excluded and what sorts of people those will be and we'll come back to that later. Once you work out that there may be critical points or bottlenecks in your design, you look at design priorities for changing the design and then you return back to the task breakdown again and continue until you've eliminated as many uh, design bottlenecks as you can for specific areas of uh, uh, of inclusion. One good method of uh, breaking down your tasks in a specific part of your design is a response chart where each column consists of a stage in some sort of required process or some task that you're expecting your uh, user to be able to do and each uh, row consists of a modality such as vision, hearing, dexterity, locomotion, spoken communication, and thinking in this example. Now, this is quite an old fashioned example, but the idea is that you might be dialing a speaking clock. Um, and this can happen for a variety of reasons. It's not simply a very old slide. It's because of people who, who don't necessarily have the same method of, of, of reading time as we do. Um, and going across on the left hand side to the right hand side for the visual capability, you need to be able to see the handset in order to pick it up. You need to be able to read a number of the speaking clock as you dial it. You need to be able to read numbers on the buttons. Uh, you don't need any requirement, visual requirement to listen to what the, what the system says. And then you need to see where um, the receiver goes in an old fashioned telephone, or in fact, you need to uh, see where the buttons are in order to uh, uh, cancel a, a call. Uh, and then at the end of the, of the row, you record the maximum difficulty level. So this can be adapted for any task. Again, moving down, hearing, you need to be able to hear the dialing tone. You need to be able to have no hearing capability to, uh, to actually perform the di dialing. Uh, but you do need to be able to hear the beeps for the button presses as you press them on the keypad. Uh, you do need to be able to hear the words spoken by the, by the speaking clock system or the other system. And you need to be able to hear the receiver as you, as you replace it. And then you estimate for the entire task for that modality, so hearing, for example, what the maximum level is. And you proceed to do this 
for the remainder of these uh, sections. So for example, for dexterity, it's important to be able to use one hand for holding the handset um, and use the other hand to press buttons. Now clearly, if that's uh, a capability range issue, it requires those two, uh, those two hands and uh, without it, the difficulty level would be considerably higher. And again, if you look at uh, spoken communication and thinking, there is a certain amount of uh, cognitive or thinking demand for each step as well, and you need to make some sort of estimate of that. Another way of, or a perhaps more easily uh, carried out method is to characterize the user in a very rich way, uh, either through interviewing them or in some cases through following them or um, actually shadowing them. And the user, of course, has to be chosen to be of a range. So they could be an, what we would call an extreme user, somebody, for example, who was born without arms, or they might be a less extreme user uh, and somebody who has uh, a relatively uh, a, lot, uh, a small amount of, say, um, arthritis or something of this sort, or they have cataracts or minor visual, visual uh, or, or visual uh, impairments. The idea is to build up a very rich picture of their lives throughout the process of the day or throughout as they, as they move around it in your um, environment that you are designing and then to try and apply creative design approaches to issues that crop up. Now, this example is a very extreme example, but it, it involves creative design solutions to problems which were very successful in design competitions. But at the core of the whole approach, is to look at the implications of the design issues for the wider population, as well as uh, calculate, uh, of creating designs. For example, here is a design of a plaster that can be used with one hand. The idea of this will build a rich picture and that picture enables you to understand the user's requirements better in the course of their, uh, in their, their day, if you like, with your, with your, with your uh, design. One way you can record that is to actually form your own um, descriptions of people as persona who represent specific types of people who you've talked to or who you think might for inclusive reasons be worth considering as a potential visitor to your offsite. Um, you might consider the journeys they have to take to get to you and to actually return uh, to go through the system through, through your design and to exit the design and to assist you with that it is very helpful to actually be able to to obtain of statistics or other forms of data um, survey data for example on similar sites uh, that gives you an idea of what type of uh, activities they are wanting and what type of, of, of um, journeys they may make and also what type of uh, things they might want to do uh, so these are examples from other work that we've done using uh, cards for personas and also uh, representing uh, proportions of different types of journeys. Finally, it's worth noting the best way to bring all the information together is actually by using a concept or requirement table. And the idea is here is uh, this is part of uh, approach taken in engineering where the requirements for a design are simply listed row by row. Each, each requirement is, is separate from the others and has a, a range of columns associated with it. The source of the requirement, whether it came from an interview or for a focus group perhaps, the name of it, uh, some sort of name, description of it, a rationale behind the idea, and then whether that's a mandatory uh, choice for the designer or whether they, they, can, uh, they, they can avoid it. And any notes associated with inclusion would be in the last column. Um, this then would be a, a complete document containing all the information you'd collected together from all the sources, whether that be surveys, focus groups, independent interviews, shadowing, uh, or, or statistical data. And then all of it would be compiled into one, into one requirements table, which you would then merge with the requirements for from other aspects of your design approach to the problem. And that is, a, a, in a nutshell, the sort of range of methods you would like to, 
you'd like to be able to use and include it to add inclusion to your design approach. Um, it just remains to say, um, in reality, rather than online, uh, some things are not obvious, such as the visibility of signage, for example, and therefore has to be um, tested or possibly field trialed. Anyway, thanks very much and good luck with your projects.